Hey, what's going on everybody? Today I'm gonna do a little bit different of a video. I'm gonna actually be just going through this uh, Linus Tech Tips video and just doing a little bit of commentary on it. So I found this the other week. It's actually a fairly old video. I think they did it uh, about four or five months ago, but basically they were upgrading their office to a 10 gigabit connection and apparently their networking consultant um, quit. So it's pretty much just the Linus Tech Tips uh, team trying to almost fumble their way through how to uh, upgrade their um, networking devices such as their router, uh, putting in a new switch, and kind of figuring out what their networking guy did before and making everything work. So first off, if you haven't checked out Linus Tech Tips, uh, it's an awesome channel. I've been watching it for years. Their main content is basically PC gaming and PC hardware, but they do the occasional video on networking from time to time. I actually really like it because it kind of gives you a little bit of perspective from the other side. Like for me, when I was actually uh, getting into technology, I started just doing computer hardware and PC builds and just kind of messing around with uh, just general desktops. And then obviously I got into gaming because, I mean, honestly, I think all of us uh, play video games and are fairly into that kind of stuff so that was an obvious place for me to start and it wasn't until I actually got into uh, the job market that I started learning and working with networking. So I might kind of rag on them a little bit for in my mind getting a few things wrong but it's honestly pretty refreshing to kind of just watch someone fumble their way through it. At least they know enough to be dangerous and they try to really fix it and make it the way it should be, but there are a few shortcomings, I think, and just thought I'd make a video on uh, commenting on these uh, kind of small things that they do. And all right, before I ramble on too much, let's just uh, kind of get in here. I'm just going to be taking clips from various parts of these videos, and there's two or three of them, actually, that I'm just going to pick out the uh, networking-centric uh, clips and kind of talk a little bit about what I like and what I think they got wrong. I wish I didn't have to be in here on a Saturday, but the problem is we have a whack ton of stuff to do to fix our server room and our network, and the only time you can really do this sort of stuff is when people aren't using it. So the first thing right here in the first few seconds of the video, he's talking about them being in there on a Saturday to do their maintenance. This is something a lot of people might not realize if they don't actually work in networking, but a lot of your major maintenance is going to be done either after the business hours or on the weekends. So you want to minimize your impact on the people that you're actually serving network access to. So they've elected to come in on the weekend so that they can get all the maintenance down, tear the network to shreds, and then bring it back up by Monday when the other employees actually get there and need to start using the network. Telus came in for the site survey and we get to redo all of this networking so that they can get access to this to slide it out. <laughs> so here's one of those things that uh, they definitely did wrong when they installed that. If you look at the top of that rack where all the cables are just kind of going over directly on top of all the equipment, basically what they did was they got a couple of their devices up there stuck behind all those cables because there's no way that you can pull out that device that he's talking about without unplugging those cables, which is not something you want to do. And it's not something you can do without causing an outage. So first off, when they installed that, they should have gone up the sides of the rack and used good cable management and kept the cables out of the way. I mean, those cables actually look like they're managed fairly well. It's just unfortunate that they put them right in front of other devices. That's something you definitely don't want to do. And now they're paying the price where they actually need to do maintenance and remove that device and all those cables are in the way. So when you are doing a network install, kind of try to think ahead a little bit and see if uh, you might uh, cause yourself an issue later. That was bad design. It's the Como. Yeah, I like how he said bad design. One of the scariest things that I do around here. Oh, turn the servers off? Turn the servers off. <laughs> so I can kind of relate to uh, how he's feeling right now where uh, he has to turn all of the servers off. It's kind of weird when you have to do that for so many devices at the same time. He's basically shutting off his entire closet to do this. And it's always weird when you're just used to it being on. And it's also not really a good day because most of these devices, especially servers or enterprise networking equipment, they were designed to run 24-7 and they weren't really made to uh, be rebooted often or definitely unplugged or come offline or anything like that. Most of the time, especially when I'm dealing with servers, you turn it off, something's going to go wrong. 
which he probably already knows. He's probably done this before, and he knows that when he turns those off, he's probably asking for trouble. So that's kind of a little bit of foreshadowing there. But also, it's just weird to turn that equipment off when we're used to it being just on. I've actually been in the situation before where we had a major disaster happen, and we had to power down an entire data center. Now that's weird when you work in that data center every day and then you have to walk in there and just start pulling cables and turning everything off before you destroy it. So I know that's not really related to what he's doing here, but I, I just that just reminded me of that story. It's really weird to walk around a data center floor in complete silence. So this is a new router. It handles 10 gig. It'll be running PFSense, which means that we'll have uh, much lower level access to uh, handling all of our networking tasks. So uh, if something goes wrong, we don't have to be like, well, okay, is it a firmware issue? We can go in and be like, yeah, it's a configuration issue. We can just edit this file and off we go. The reason. So this is one of the parts that I don't really understand. So he just said that that's their new router and it's uh, running PFSense. And actually, just by looking at it, it looks like it's one of uh, their actual NetGate hardware platforms, which is a pretty expensive and pretty beefy router. Now, the reason that they need it is because they're upgrading to 10 gigabit, so they need some horsepower and throughput. Now, that'll definitely give it to them. That's a pretty high-end uh, router. But what he said about the reason uh, for them putting it in is to get a lower level access to it. He mentioned that instead of just thinking it's a firmware issue, they can go in there and uh, see that there's a configuration error. That I don't understand because later you're gonna see that they're actually replacing an Edge Router Pro with this thing. So I, d I don't really understand what he's talking about with uh, not having configuration or lower level access to uh, the configuration now because an Edge Router Pro is uh, about as granular as you're gonna get with a router. I mean, it's a business if not low-end enterprise grade router, so this one's not really gonna give them any more configuration uh, flexibility than the Edge router already has. So I'm not really sure what the whole thing behind that reasoning is, but uh, they do need it for 10 gigabit. I mean, they don't necessarily need a high-end PFSense box for 10 gigabit. Ubiquity makes a 10 gigabit Edge router, but PFSense is a valid option. I just don't really understand his reasoning behind that is we're getting faster internet so it okay well basically yeah he said the reason they need it's because they're getting the 10 gigabit which yes of course here's the thing johnny who originally set up all of our vlans and all of our routing and all of that stuff has sort of retired from the it consultancy business okay so he, he didn't quit that he retired he just left anyways yeah he's not there anymore we're going to be trying to piece together everything that he did on our ubiquity gear and then reassemble it on our PF Sense box from Supermicro here. In theory, this is just gonna be a simple one-to-one -one instant swap -a rooney It's not going to be. So, J Jake's right, um, it, it's not going to be. I do like that they at least acknowledge that the PF Sense is a lot different than the uh, edge router configuration. So basically they're going in there, they're going to look at their config that was on the edge router and they're going to try and in a sense reverse engineer it to go on the PF Sense box. But to do that they kind of have to at least have an idea of what they're looking at. They have to have some knowledge in order to actually translate that over to PF Sense. And it's good that he's optimistic, but those are the lines that you'll hear all the time in networking, and that is, oh, well, it should just be a one-for-one -one swap. Should go great. That's what everybody says all the time, and it rarely ever goes that way, as you will see in the rest of his video if you actually watch the whole thing. Things don't just uh, go like they thought they would. So I finally got an IP address, be able to access the PFSense box. This cable that we had for the test card is Garbaggio. So I like that he had a cable problem, because that's usually the most common uh, thing that goes wrong is an actual physical issue, something bad with the cable, but it's usually the last uh, thing you think about, so him trying to grab an IP off the router so that he can start looking and doing configuration changes, but couldn't because his cable was broken. Uh, he probably sat on that for about a half hour, which is usually about how long it takes for you to realize that your cable is bad if there's no other... Uh, indication, especially if only a f couple of pairs are bad or a few. Uh, sometimes you can actually get link lights and it'll say that there is an active link there, but it won't work because your uh, 
pins are shorted or just not connected at all. So I, I kind of like that he had that error, even though it sucks to do it. Yay, we're started. Yeah, we've got the Xeon D, 2.3 gigahertz, 16 threads, eight cores. We've got 32 gigs, 32 gigs of RAM. It's, I think I read somewhere that. So that is a beefy router. That's basically a server. I don't know why they need something that powerful for a router, but I mean, I guess it's never a bad thing to have too much power in there. Uh, 10 gigabit definitely doesn't need that kind of power unless they're trying to like switch it all in the CPU and do some QoS on 10 gigabits, but I mean, that just seems like complete overkill to me, but... Also, I really hope it didn't matter that I changed the order of these. Probably not, hopefully. <laughs> oh, I really hope not. How many combinations? So not exactly a networking thing, but he was tearing these servers apart and he's taking the hard drives out and he's hoping that the server didn't need them to be in any particular slot, which a lot of servers do. It all depends on the configuration, so... He might not know exactly how that particular server was configured, but I know certain um, systems, like the one that I actually run, I run Unraid, and it actually does matter which uh, slot the hard drives are in because it ties a specific, um, I think it's like a drive profile or something, to a particular SATA slot. So if the drive is missing from that slot, then it'll throw an error. So I can understand why he's uh, concerned here, because at least on mine, if I was to just rip all my hard drives out and if I didn't have the labels that I put on them there, then when I put them back in, it would be a lot of trial and error and a lot of headache trying to get them back in the exact order that they came out in. How's this going, Anthony? I think this is about ready to go. Seriously? Basically, I just need to change the interface over so that it uses a VLAN. Okay. But uh, once I change that over to the uh, office LAN, we should just be able to drop it in and it should basically just work. Should or will? Uh, well, you said, well, that's the million dollar question. Should or will? Um, you always want to say that it should work as soon as you put it in there because you did the configuration and you obviously know what you're doing. So why wouldn't it work when you throw it in there? But nine times out of 10, when you throw it in there, you're going to have an issue. So this is another change we're making. We're putting the DHCP server back on our router. We're taking it off that uh, VM that was running on one of the Windows servers. Which we technically so already did. That was, uh, did we turn that off already? So moving the DHCP server off of a virtual machine or any other kind of server and onto the router isn't really a major change and it's mostly preference, but at least by doing that, they're going to have to, uh, well, not have to, but they're able to take away their uh, relay configurations from the router so that traffic from all the hosts needing an IP address doesn't have to hit the router and then get relayed to a different server. It's just going to be right there on the router. Honestly, that makes uh, no difference at all, but it's just kind of a preference thing long time ago. Remember okay. when our internet broke? The internet was broken for like a week. Turns out our router's date was set to 2016. That was a good year though. <laughs> <laughs> and so apparently they had already moved it onto the router previously and it didn't work because the date was wrong, which is actually a pretty common issue. It's just I don't think I've ever seen it happen on a router. Usually when you have the date issues, it's on a client system with like uh, the internet, Google or whatever, you try to uh, browse to a website and it'll throw SSL errors and it won't let you in because your clock is wrong. Try it. Go on your Windows PC, change your clock to like three years ago, and then just try to use the internet. You're going to have a lot of issues. And then let's get this Edge Router Pro out of here. PFSense actually has a really cool feature. What's it called? Carp failover or something like that? Uh, something like that. So we're just rolling out one for now, but in the future, we can actually have them both connected and running. In the event that one does experience some kind of malfunction, we can just uh, have it fail over automatically. So what he's talking about there with Carp, uh, C-A-R-P, I believe that's called Common, oh, Common Address Redundancy Protocol, I believe. It's basically just another first hop redundancy protocol such as HSRP or VRRP, which are more of the common standards. But basically what it does is it allows uh, you to have one virtual IP address as the default gateway for your clients. And you can have it running essentially between two physical devices. So say your 192.168.0.1 address is your virtual IP address. And that's going to be your default gateway for all your clients. But you could have one router with uh, 0.2 and another router with 0.3 running and responding to that virtual IP address. And it runs in an active and passive uh, relationship, basically a, a master and a standby. 
so that if there was an issue like a catastrophic failure on one of your routers then it would automatically uh, fail over to the standby the standby would become active and it would start responding to requests for that virtual IP address so basically there's little to no downtime now there is a little bit of configuration to that like if there was actually a link failure it wouldn't detect that until a timer expired if you were even tracking for link failures but most of the time it's either you're going to do maintenance on one of the routers so you shut it down instant fail over to the other one or your router just dies or loses power or something and then nobody notices because you have a virtual IP address that's running between the two and the standby will just take over the responsibility for responding now what I don't really understand there is on the bottom of the screen it said we would have two edge routers but they're not using the edge router anymore they're taking it out and they're putting in the pfSense box and what I really don't understand about that is why they're bringing up uh, the fact that pfSense can run CARP when an edge router can run VRRP which is essentially the same thing so they're not really gaining that ability by using pfSense it's just maybe they saw it on the spec list and thought it was interesting but I mean technically what they have right now could also do that. Now the other thing is that if you're using uh, two routers here for failover you're gonna need two uplinks as well but as far as I was able to gather they're only getting one um, internet connection in there. So unless these routers were going to like another upstream device such as a switch or something that the internet connection would plug into they're not really going to gain that level of redundancy from that because there's gonna be no other path out to the internet they're only getting one fiber in there and it's gonna connect to one of those devices and they're not really gonna be able to uh, fail over and still have internet access at least because whichever router that uplink is on once that dies there's gonna be no other way out so really in the configuration that at least they're going for right now uh, those protocols aren't really gonna matter like, I think at most you drop, like, a handful of packets. It's no big deal. And, it, yeah, him just talking about that. Dropping a handful of packets, yeah, they, it drops very little in the event of an instant failover. The only time you are going to drop packets is if it's an indirect failure, which is basically a link going bad upstream or something. And that you have to configure it to actually track for that failure. So it's got 48 10 gig RJ45 ports, and then... This is delicious. delicious. It's got six more of these 40 gig QSFP plus ports or whatever. Tasty. What's on the bottom? That's our edge router? At so that switch is actually pretty awesome, but it's also super expensive. And I believe he said it's going to be their main switch. So I believe that's actually going to be their uh, user access switch as well, which I mean, if you've watched Lions Tech Tip videos at all, you know that they have a lot of video editors and they mainly do server based video editing. So their actual desktops need a lot of bandwidth to be able to edit these video files over the network. And that switch is awesome because it's all basically uh, standard copper RJ45 connections that are 10 gigabit and it's got the 40 gig uplinks. Now he would have to have something else on the other end of those uplinks that supports that 40 gig, which I believe uh, previously I skipped over it, but they had a network uh, interface card that was actually capable of 40 gigs so they can actually have a lot of bandwidth there between the switch and the server so that uh, it's not saturated. Now the only kind of concern I would have with running a switch like that is I'm not really sure the distance between this uh, communication closet and their actual um, like editing suites. I don't think it's very far but one of the downsides with uh, 10 gigabit and regular copper is that you can't push that full 10 gigabit speed over the distance that you could with regular 100 meg or gigabit connections. At least not without moving up in the uh, tiers of network cabling. So like with Cat6 or Cat5e, if they're using Cat5e here, they wouldn't be able to get that full 100 meter distance with 10 gigabit speeds. So their desktops would have to be relatively close to this closet for them to uh, actually not have issues using straight copper and just kind of judging by what I'm seeing here I mean it looks like a couple of those connections are at least shielded so that's a plus but I wouldn't really put a lot of money on them having the latest and greatest uh, category of copper cables uh, I forgot to mention typically when you're doing 10 gigabit it's gonna be um, on fiber and a lot of the installations that I see at least in office building if they're doing 10 gigabit to the desktop they're using SFPs and multi-mode fiber not just a straight regular copper and it's because of that distance limitation and interference which interference interferes with the distance as well but besides the point 
given everything I know about networking, yes. this is not going to work. It'll never work. What? Why? Uh, not the first time. Shut ever. up. Given everything I know, all the experience I've ever had with networking gear. Fine. It's not going to work? Let me know when you want to try it or if you want to. So I'm kind of want, curious as to what he was actually looking at for him to actually say, given everything I know, it won't work. Uh, that's, I've given a lot of answers in my life, and that's never been one of them. Maybe in my mind, I thought, like, oh, this just can't work because I don't understand something. But I've never been like, well, given everything I understand, there's, it's impossible for this to work. Like, it, it has to work. That's, that's its purpose. It was, it was made to work with uh, what they're doing. You should just get a new rack. Do you want to come in for the additional <laughs> weekend that it would take to swap racks? I don't even want to think about how long or what it would take to swap out an entire rack. At least that rat's nest, which I've actually seen a lot worse. Com Communication clauses can get a lot, uh, a lot dirtier and a lot messier than that thing is. But anytime you're talking about swapping racks, you're talking a major, major undertaking. And me just looking at those patch panels in the top just kind of brings back nightmares because that's one of the things that I absolutely hate doing is terminating a patch panel. If they were to put a new rack in there, they would have to undo all of the rear connections of that patch panel, pull them up and then remount everything in a new rack and re-terminate it. Now, I don't really know what the back of that looks like. Maybe it's RJ45 on both sides, but typically it's punched down on the rear of a patch panel, and then your typical plug-in interfaces on the front, and punching all of those down, oh, I've done so many of those, and oh, I hate it. We need to switch those fans around, eh? Which way are they going? They're blowing out this way. Oh crap, I remember that now. No, we can't flip those fans around. <laughs> so, kudos to them for actually installing the switch with the interfaces in the rear. That is the proper way to put a switch in. I know usually a lot of people like to uh, see the blinky lights in the front or have uh, access right in the front of the rack to all the interfaces, but it does make uh, cable management and just uh, administration in general a lot easier when your interfaces are in the back of the rack. But what happens is you do, with certain uh, types of switches, get where the air is actually exhausting out the front of the rack. And in a data center, that's, uh, that's no bueno, because typically data centers are set up with a uh, hot and cold aisle configuration. So all the fans of all the devices in a rack will be exhausting out the back into the hot aisle and when you have multiple rows you'll have two of them both exhausting into the same aisle and then your air conditioning or your HVAC system will be blowing the cool air into the cold aisles which is the front of the rack where the air is actually uh, going into the devices to cool them off so obviously in this little closet that they have they don't have a hot or cold aisle but having a device in the rack that's exhausting in the opposite direction of everything else is just something that you don't really want to have and what Linus just said is they can't reverse the direction of the fans but that's something to pay attention to especially in the data center is uh, which way uh, the fans are actually going to be blowing and I know I think it's the Cisco Nexus series actually have a front exhaust on them because they're meant to be put in a data center this with wait where the hell was that plugged into uh, on the other side <laughs> so him wondering where that just plugged into. One of the first things you want to do when you're uh, doing a reconfiguration or an install or anything like this is you want to actually label your cables. So if they're not already labeled, which they should be, then the first thing is to label them so that you know where they came from and where you're going to be plugging them in when you're done taking equipment out. It's not exactly critical that you label like user ports so all of the connections go into their desktops and the editing suites. They don't really need to label because the switch really doesn't care as long as they're not um, any sort of uh, special configuration to it. So like if he was actually segregating his network up into multiple VLANs and like one room was on one VLAN and another room was another, then he might want to label where those cables came from so that he can put them back where they need to go and be on the proper VLAN with the proper switch configurations. Now the one he was dealing with there I think was their actual uh, uplink. You definitely want to make sure all your uplinks are labeled. Regardless of if you're doing maintenance or not, that should just always be a thing is have your uplinks labeled at a minimum. Uh, Anthony figured out why we're not getting an IP. Anthony? You mean we figured out? Well, he, I figured out. He figured out we were not getting an IP. What do you mean you figured well, out? I figured out why. I said, did you set it? And I then... told you why. I asked if we needed a static IP. Uh, well, I didn't hear you. Okay. <laughs> so, 
So they're they're saying that they figured out why they weren't getting an IP, and it was because they needed one statically assigned. Which I mean, just watching this video, I don't really know what all they did prior to them getting to this point, but. I feel like if they had a static IP, that is a pretty critical piece of information that they should have known. So maybe he was dealing with the WAN interface on that router, in which case uh, I don't know why he would expect uh, to get a DHCP address if it wasn't plugged in. I mean, I don't know. I don't really know what he was working on, so I, I can only kind of speculate as to what went wrong, but that's kind of one of those common things. You really should know which interfaces uh, are static, which interfaces are DHCP. And I feel like if they would have had a uh, network drawing or a topology map or something, that they would have most of the information they need to really get this off the ground. But I don't think they have any of that documentation. But this is one of those uh, reasons where you see that documentation really is key. You want to have a lot of information about your network and how it's configured and how it's laid out before you really do any maintenance. And at a minimum, before they started this, they really should have gone into everything, looked at it, kind of got a lay of the land, done some show commands, uh, figured out what's connected to what, what has what configuration, what doesn't. And if it was me, I would be writing all of that down and I would actually draw out a map of how it's configured. Because even if you do have networking documentation, sometimes if you don't keep up with it uh, regularly, then it'll get out of date. And even though you have a map of everything, it could be just completely wrong and not really help you. So one of the best things you can do is just kind of go in there, poke around, and kind of make your own rough map uh, before you even start something like this. And hopefully uh, losing a lot of time because you didn't statically assign an IP that should have been there uh, won't happen to you. Trying to access that router so I can get the settings off of it, so I can get our internet back up. Long story short, VLANs. They don't work when you plug it directly into a computer. Oh, I have a switch for you. <laughs> okay. Um, honestly, I thought he was already on the Edge router getting those configurations, but I guess I maybe he was just trying to set up the PFSense box and get it going beforehand. I'm a little confused on that timeline, because I swear I saw the Edge router out there before, unless this is just editing magic. But anyways, what he's talking about there, he was spending some time uh, trying to do something and he figured out that you can't just plug in uh, the laptop directly to the router and have it work because of VLANs, which is entirely true because a computer doesn't create VLAN tags, it's just a straight untagged interface that plugs in and is on whatever network that port is configured for. Now I'm assuming that he was probably trying to plug it into one of the ports on the router that uh, was set up for VLAN tags. So when he plugs the laptop in, he's automatically gonna be on the uh, untagged VLAN or native in the Cisco world. In which case, if that uh, VLAN wasn't set up as the management or it was locked down in any sort of way, then he wouldn't have any access to that router at all. So this is kind of uh, the beginning of a common theme that I kind of noticed while watching these. I don't really think they understand what VLANs are or what they do really. Because this isn't the uh, first time they're going to run into issues with the VLANs. Well, I, I have a switch here that I just plugged in. Oh yeah, that's the switch I was going to give you. So Linus. Yeah. Oh, so I guess their solution to that was to put a switch between them, which, yes, that actually would be a good solution if you want to have access to all of the VLANs straight off the computer. But also, I don't really understand how that would fix his issue there, because the switch you plug into has to... Uh, also have tags for all the other VLANs if you uh, want access to them at a layer 2 level. Otherwise it's almost the exact same thing as just plugging the computer in there. It all has to do with the configurations that you put on that port he's plugging into. So I don't really understand how that switch fixed his problem. I think that we're ready to go. You think? I'm reasonably sure we're ready to go. This isn't even powered on yet. Do you have the That's the best answer I've heard so far. I, I've got to use that. The ear screws? Are the ear screws here? Yeah. I actually don't know what we will do. We will learn <laughs> command line switch configuration. Um, that's kind of bad if they don't already know that. So I, I guess those switches could have a graphical interface for configuration, but I mean, I've never dealt with those Dell switches, but something that high end is usually guaranteed to have command line, and you really should know uh, your configuration with equipment like this if you're trying to put it into a network that has any sort of complexity such as this one. So uh, we already know that they're running VLANs, and they're 
possibly thinking about running a redundancy protocol. So that's some fairly advanced stuff. So really they should know how to um, configure switches via the command line if they're trying to do any of that. So this is kind of just makes you dread kind of what's uh, coming because if they don't know how to do uh, switch command line and they're just throwing these devices in as default, they're asking for issues, especially with VLANs. I'm gonna go upstairs and see if we have internet. The moment of truth. It's not working. <laughs> it is unreachable. <laughs> so they did all that. Uh, Linus and him were working on the servers and redoing the rack and the cleanup and all of that while uh, Anthony was working on the configuration. And they put the router in and the moment of truth came and it doesn't work, which is all too familiar to me <laughs> because I know what it's like to spend so much time configuring everything, thinking you got everything right, and then you put it in, and it just it just doesn't happen. It's not in the cards. So now they've got to enter the troubleshooting phase and try to figure out where they went wrong and why everything isn't working. But I can kind of see where this is going already with the, the VLANs and just kind of the little issues that they had regarding the router. So that's why it's it's a little it's a little cringy to watch them talk about the actual configuration of the network devices because it's obvious that they don't deal with it very much, which isn't a bad thing. And it's actually like pretty cool to see this from a perspective of somebody doing it for uh, what I don't want to say one of the first times they've done this stuff before, but kind of looking at it with fresh eyes because I already know what I would do with that and. Uh, I already think that I have an idea of what they're doing wrong and I kind of thought before they even put it in there that it wouldn't work. But in the next video they're going to move on to the actual troubleshooting so let's go ahead and bring that one up. So you said that the switch had to support VLANs, right? Yeah. Well do they have to be configured? Should have been just... Before we move on I forgot about that last line. He just asked if the VLANs needed to be configured. Yes. A thousand times. Yes. VLANs are not just a feature that something has. It's a uh, it's a feature that has to be set up. It has to be configured. Because VLANs in itself, you don't just like look at a switch on the shelf and says, oh, that supports VLAN. Kind of like uh, you look at a TV and be like, oh, that's a 1080p. It, it just has that. Um, no, VLANs, you have to tell each port, each trunk, all of that, which VLAN you want it to be a part of. It is very custom to uh, your network itself. It's not just something that works. So that right there just confirmed all of the stuff that I thought that they were doing wrong about the VLANs. I guess they just threw everything in there blank, which was pretty obvious when he said that they should probably learn switch configuration. But uh, yeah, if they had VLANs on that network and they just threw in everything blank and they have one flat network right now, then they're pretty much hosed. It's going to take a lot of configuration to get that back to where it was. And hopefully that could have been avoided if they would have actually logged into all these devices before, pulled a full config, and made a map like I would have done if I was starting something like that. But now let's move on to the next video. Just drop in unless you've configured. Are you using new switches? I'm using the Dell. So why don't I plug you guys into the Netgear switch and we see if that works? It should. Well, let's see if it does. I guess I really should stop talking before I say that we're going to move on because basically what he just said there was that they're going to put their old Netgear switch back in, plug up to that and see if that works, which it might because it had the correct configurations on it from before. However, since they swapped out the router, it's probably still not going to work. Because if they didn't configure the VLANs on the switch, they probably didn't configure them right on the router. In which case, just using the old switch isn't really going to solve that issue.